Okay, thank you everyone for joining me this afternoon. Um, so my name is Michelle, I'm the success coach here um, working at Mango High. So it's my job to make sure that, you know, all of you who are either curious about Mango High or perhaps already have access to Mango High, that you are actually benefiting from um, having access to it. And of course, um, today what we will be learning is, um, so there's gonna be a few different things that we'll be covering across the next 45 minutes or so. The first thing really is to help teachers to sort of walk away from this session being fairly or feeling like they're quite familiar with the types of activities that are available on Mango High and of course how to actually assign them to your students. We will also be taking a look at um, how your students actually play around on Mango High, so in other words how they access those activities that you have assigned for them as well as how to track their own progress which is really really powerful. Um, so let me get started. So the first thing we want to be talking about today is um, basically this idea that on Manga High there will be two different types of activities your students are working on. Okay, um, but more importantly than anything, and I have actually um, put together this set of slide deck on the file download in the webinar session, by the way, so feel free to download it. Um, what we really wanted to talk about, like I mentioned, is how your students track their progress, how do students work um, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and of course, how do teachers support your students on a one-on-one -on -one basis as well. Okay, so to start with, like I said, let's have a look at the different types of activities on Manga High. Now, the idea here is there will be two different types of activities. Um, there is the Prodigy Learning Quizzes, which is all about developing that deep understanding and reasoning skills in your students. Then there are the games activities, which is all about developing fluency through the strategic skill and drill or repetition. So we kind of tap into the neuroscience of, of learning or, or of long-term memory formation, which is this process of long-term potentiation, which basically just means you want to fire the same neural pathways over and over again and um, really just be able to allow your students to be able to recall information or create associations with existing information as much as they possibly can. So let me jump into the live screen so we can talk a little bit more about the different types of activities and how to be successful with them. So I have pulled up here a student page. So this is a sample student account. As you can see, it's my name on the left hand side. All of the activities your students have, um, have access to or they can access it from the left-hand panel here. So anything that you have assigned for them will sit under the Assigned tab, okay? Um, anything that the system has recommended to them will sit under the Recommended tab. So for those of you who are new to Manga High, Recommended is where your students are accessing activities that's personalised for them. So, um, you know, you'll be working, so the idea here is every activity on Manga High is all organised algorithmically based on that whole you know, maths learning scope and sequence effectively. So if your students are struggling with a particular concept, the program or Manga High platform will actually look for the prerequisite task and actually recommends it to your students. So in terms of the workflow for our kids, we always suggest that you know they need to prioritise the assigned tasks, but they also need to pop into the recommended at least once a week to check what's been suggested for them and actually work through those as well, all right? So to start off with, um, of course, they can access the assigned task or the recommended work. And you can also see there are two different types of logos or this sort of blue, orangey kind of motives. This is the adaptive quizzes. So the idea here is anything that um, you know looks like this, that's where they do the prodigy quizzes. And then anything that has these rich games graphics, these are what we call the games activities on Manga High. And we will go through some of the games together, and uh, but more importantly, I'll also show you where to get some help with regards to the games as well. Okay, um, so let's start with completing this particular activity here. It's an activity called Understand Square Roots. And I'm not, this is not for the purpose of, you know, making sure we all know how to do this task, but it's really to show you what the correct workflow is, especially at the start of the year. It's really important that teachers set some sort of expectations on your, on your kids, uh, making sure that they are developing the correct workflow so that they make sure, so we can make sure that they are successful when working through Manga High. 
Okay, so to start with, your students will always start at the easy level. So we don't get to set what level they start at. Everyone starts at easy. But what gets really interesting is that your students will start sort of, because the system personalizes the learning, some students will move on from easy pretty quickly, whereas some students might stay at the easy level for a lot longer than others. Now, the key here is students need to understand, they need to answer three questions in a row correct in order to move up to the next level, okay? So we can see up here, three questions. So we can see up here, there are three questions that we need to answer and we are starting at the easy level question. And um, there's a little timer here that sort of, that's sort of working itself down at the moment. Um, basically, every quiz comes with a timer the easy questions will have 60 seconds for your students to input an answer and as the questions get harder it will be 75 seconds 120 seconds and so forth and so on now if you are finding that your students are really struggling with the whole timer concept then when you are assigning tasks which i will show you later on you can actually turn it off for your students so for the purpose of the next few minutes what we are trying to do is i just want to show you how your students experience the prodigy quiz and how important it is to make sure that um, you set the expectations right now the, the other thing that happens here also is you could be assigning this task for everybody in the class um, but different students, all the students will actually get slightly different variations of the questions to start off with. So the idea is if you've got kids working next to each other, they can't just simply copy off each other in order to, um, you know, get the answers correctly. All right. So, oh, sorry, four is the square root of, sorry, misread that question, obviously. Okay. So the idea here is um, I'll answer as many questions as I can. I want to show you what happens. Because I got that question incorrect, I've effectively started again. So uh, square root of 36, I need to answer three in a row correct in order to move up to medium. But I also want to show you what happens at the end when your students have completed their 10 questions. So every Prodigy quiz, it will have 10 questions. Every attempt has 10 questions. Students are encouraged to make multiple attempts, at least three attempts in fact. Um, and the idea is uh, they make three attempts, but between each re-attempt, they need to check and review the incorrect answers. So we wanna start changing our students' relationships with mistakes. We don't want them to feel uncomfortable um, about making mistakes. We want them to use mistakes as an opportunity to help them grow. And this is really important to actually put into their workflow as well. So because we get three medium in a row correct, hopefully we will be getting into the hard level question. Okay, so we're now at hard, which is our 10th question. Um, and at the end of the 10th question, you'll see a summary screen. So at this point, your students can see which questions they got right, which questions they got wrong. In this case, we haven't earned ourselves a medal yet. Um, in fact, in order to earn a bronze medal, which is the pass mark, your students actually need to be answering at least three hard questions correct um, in order to gain that sort of 4,200 points um, that they need in order to pass. Now, when we say pass on Manga High, we say bronze medal. So what it means is they need to get at least a bronze medal. And that could come from answering three hard questions correct, or it could, become, it could come from answering two or three hard questions and the remainder at extreme. Okay, um, so there are four tiers of difficulties. So easy, medium, hard, then extreme. Three in a row correct in order to move up. Now, because we haven't got a medal yet in this case, or we haven't passed, and it is our first attempt after all, we wanna click on review to review those questions that we got wrong. Um, and at this point, I encourage you to get your students to pull out their pen and paper. So it's really important that your students don't look at Manga High as just that sort of standalone activity that they do on the, on the screen. Um, they really need to have a workbook next to them at the same time. So any questions we get wrong, we go back and review it, click on show solution. And when you are showing solution, write it down in your book, get your kids to actually write down what was the question, um, how do you solve it? And even write a reflection, why did I get it wrong? So in this case, I had misread the question as asking for the square root of four, 
All right. So that was a silly mistake on my part. But it is so important for your students to reflect on why they made a mistake, because that's when they uncover perhaps questions where they realise, OK, well, this is a concept that I really need some help with. OK, so taking more ownership over their own learning rather than just focusing on that right or wrong quick answers. So once we have um, you know, reviewed all of our questions, then what we can do is we can go back and actually play again. Or you can review, you know, the next question and so forth and so on. So when your students play again, what will happen is they will start at the level that they finished. So if we have finished at hard, you'll then start at hard and then progress into um, extreme questions. If you had finished at extreme, it will start you at extreme. So the idea here is the, um, you know, the progress is that you need to make three attempts in order to pass and in order, sorry, in, in order to, you know, grow towards the next level okay so it's really important that we point this out to our students it starts at easy and then we progressively go into medium and hard and extreme questions and of course getting our students to use Prodigy as that opportunity to develop deeper understanding and reasoning skills so when your students have passed and got a bronze medal they can always aim to get a little bit high higher and get a silver or a gold medal so in order to get a gold medal just um, in terms of what we've just seen they need to answer 10 extreme questions correctly to get a gold medal. All right. Um, any questions in the chat box for me at the moment? Let me just have a quick check. No? Feel free to ask any questions if you have any along the way. Now, the next thing I wanted to show you are obviously the games activities. So there's going to be a whole collection of games. Um, teachers can, and we do encourage you to assign the games as well. So don't think of games as just that sort of fun Friday afternoon activities. The nice balance we encourage regularly is to, you know, have two activity, two prodigy activities assigned and one game activity assigned per week. So have a look at your timetabling. Are you doing Manga High for homework? Are you doing it every Thursday afternoon after lunch? Um, have some kind of routine because that's really going to help your students be successful as well. So as far as games, I'm not going to be able to go through every single game and show you how to play it. But what is common within the games is that um, as a teacher, you can, um, you know, bring up the game as a sort of a tune in activity as well. Or um, sometimes you don't necessarily have to teach the concept before you teach the games, because if they, your students don't know the maths, then they will sort of put their hands up and say, well, I couldn't get to level 35 because I don't know improper fractions, for example. So um, sometimes it is powerful just to open with the game. Now, there is no right or wrong. Uh, you know, there are definitely times when, you know, I always I, I open with a prodigy activity. Sometimes I open with a game just to mix it up a little bit. So it's totally up to you and how you want to connect and engage with your class. But what I wanted to show you here is that there are two different types of activities and the and where they fit in. Now, it looks like my internet's not going to let me um, open that game, but let me see what else I can do. So students do have access to the game centre and um, from the game centre, they do have access to all of the games that's available on Manga High. But what we do say is we encourage teachers to actually assign the games because what happens is when you assign the games, your students are pointed to effectively the correct level of the game uh, that is matched to the curriculum standard. But look, that said, if your kids are playing, you know, extra games, at the end of the day, the games are designed so strategically to make sure that there is a lot, a really good solid maths pedagogy in it. So they're not really totally wasting their time either. They're just going above and beyond, okay? Um, so this game here that I've got up here is a game called Pyramid Panic. But basically, the concept here is, you know, every single game has its own kind of storyline. So don't ever feel like you need to be the expert of any of these games before you assign it to your students. But that said, I do encourage you to, you know, in your free time, <laughs> if you have any, uh, just go ahead and play some of the games activities just to give yourself a sense of, you know, what the games are about. And, um, and how you get through it. So again, as with the Prodigy activities that we saw earlier, games also get a lot trickier as you progress through them. So um, in this case, for example, I know this line here is going to be two, and because that's a square, that's a two, so two minus two, so five, two, two, so that should be a nine there. And if you get questions correct, obviously you'll move up to the next level and so on. And at the end of it all, your students will then see if they have, I'm um, sorry, 
So this is not as square as it looks like. Um, so four, four, sorry, six, and that's three. Okay, so at the end, your students will see if they've earned themselves a bronze medal or a gold medal and so forth. So I'll show you what happens if I get some questions wrong. The questions actually get easier again um, and we lose, we effectively lose a life in that case, okay? So going through it. Now with the games, um, what I'm also going to be doing this year is uh, every month I will actually release a pre-recorded video on how to play a particular game. And what we're then gonna do is, um, I'll, I'll run that video, show you how to play the game, and then actually show you where to assign that game from and then encourage you as a teacher, as a um, sort of an upskill activity, I suppose. Um, you can play this, and spend you know 10 minutes or so playing the game, so you can get a sense of the types of um, activities your students are working on on here as well. Okay, so it's almost impossible to teach you every single game, but for now, just know the fact that there are a variety of games that you can choose from to assign to your students, and uh, and we're constantly building new ones as well. Okay. So, um, so again, this one here, so two, I'm just going to guess it, I'm sorry, it's the end of the day, um, but I kind of want to get to the end just to show you what happens. At the end, your students will see if they've lost life or if they've got themselves a bronze or silver or gold medal. Um, a bronze medal, as with all things, with games as well as with the quiz, a bronze medal indicates that you are working at curriculum standard. So in this case, I haven't actually earned a medal because I lost all my three lives before getting to the end. Um, so there are instructions associated with the games as well. But at this point, what I do want to show you is the fact that there is a whole collection of games that I'm going to show you how to assign them to your students. OK, which brings me to the next slide, which is all about. Um, sorry, let me move forward. Um, so, well, to begin with, we talked about the Prodigy quizzes. So I just want to show you quickly uh, when your students, if your students are doing easy or medium questions and they can't quite handle the hard questions, what that means is that they don't actually earn a medal. Even if they do it three times or four times or five times even and only doing easy and medium questions, they'll actually never pass. In order to pass, they need to earn themselves a bronze medal. And a bronze medal indicates that they are working at curriculum standard. So in order to get a bronze medal, they need to be answering at least three or more hard questions correct, as per the example here. Now, if they then get a bronze medal and want to challenge themselves further and see if they can earn a silver medal, then go for it. Answer some of the extreme questions right. as well. So do your hard, do your extreme questions. That gives you a, a silver medal. But if they, again, want to push themselves further, they can all the way, go all the way with the extreme questions and um, basically get themselves that, you know, and get themselves a gold medal, okay? So in terms of growth mindset, what we are really suggesting here is we don't want students to just say, oh, I'm just gonna do whatever I can to pass and, and get a bronze. So some students might make one attempt and manage to get a bronze already. So for those students, we always encourage them to at least do it three times and see if they can challenge myself to or challenge themselves to get to a gold standard. So really push your kids a little bit further, push them a little bit deeper. Alternatively, you might have some students who make three or four or five attempts and only manage to get a bronze medal. That's great. They've really pushed through. They need to make sure that they've checked their mistakes and use their mistakes to help them grow towards those hard and extreme questions. And this is where I was talking earlier about, you know, when they are, when they have made a mistake, make sure they actually write it down in their book. Um, because chances are when I click play again, or when they click play again, that question that they couldn't do the first time around, that's gonna come up again. And so it's really powerful for them to, to have this reference. Um, the last time I encountered this question, this is what I got wrong. Let's address it, let's fix it, and then try and get it right. And, and as they get it right, they also, it's, it's a feedback loop. They are affirming themselves that they have managed to, um, you know, actually conquer that question and be able to move up to the next level of the next question. So it's a really good affirmation as well for the kids themselves. So let's jump into, next jump into the um, the teacher page and actually see how you actually assign tasks to your students. It is nice and simple. The whole Hanger High platform is designed to be fairly sort of, you know, simple to use, fairly straightforward. So to begin with, of course, you need to log in to your teacher account, your Mango High teacher account. 
Um, and once you have logged into your Manga High teacher account, you can go into admin and actually print your students' logins out uh, if you haven't done it already and distribute it to your students. Now, if you haven't assigned any tasks for your kids yet, but you have given them their logins, that's totally cool as well because when they have logged in or when they do log in, they have access to everything that's been recommended, all the free play. So they can start exploring, so they can start benefiting from it as well. All right. So in terms of assigning tasks, it's really simple. So the first step is to make sure that you are assigning tasks to the correct class. So on the top left hand corner where it says your school's name, make sure you have the correct class selected but notice in this list that I've got some classes with a yellow star next to them so what that means is because there is this big long list and this will differ from one school to another of course you don't really want to be going through this list every single time to find your class so what you want to do is actually click on that little sort of faded star next to the class name and what it does is it tells the students or tells the system, sorry, that these are your favorite classes. So any favorited classes will appear on the top of the list. So that way, the next time you come in and you wanna assign activities for 4LF, for example, um, you know, 4LF is already front and center or on the top of the list for you, all right? So the next thing you do is actually go ahead and assign tasks, right? So if you click on assign, and I do apologize, my, my internet's a tad slow this afternoon. So um, I really do hope you guys can all still hear me and then I'm not talking to myself. But all right, so wait till this list comes up. So when you click on assign, what you will find is, um, you know, all of Mango High's activities organized based on the curriculum. So this will obviously depend on, you know, which region you're in. We've got some people in here that's in Asia. We've got some people in this session that's based in Australia and New Zealand. So all of the, you know, depending on where you are, all of this will be organized based on your curriculum expectations. So let's just say I'm teaching year four. So click on that folder, um, click, on, click on the plus on that folder, and everything is organized into substrands or strands and substrands. And notice where it says number and place value and number and place value games. So think back to those two types of activities. So there's the quiz activities, there's the games activities, and it's organized here for you. So if I click into an activity or click into a folder, I then find myself some activities that I can now assign to my students. So just clicking onto it now, here we go. All right, so a couple of things, you quite a number of things you're seeing here. So there's a lot of information. This is an activity for the year fours according to the Australian curriculum. You can click into it and you can see that this one's new, this one's new. So we're constantly adding new content on here. All right, you can also see that in some, in some of these cases, um, some tasks has already been attempted by your students. So in this case, read and write numbers up to 100,000, for example, three students has, has already done it. 14 have attempted it, but have not passed the activity. So that one there is active. And you can also see down here, compose and decompose six digit numbers. That's an activity that hasn't been assigned yet because it's neither expired nor active. So we've never had any activities on that task. So click into the activity. Um, and remembering these are the blue prodigy activities. Um, you can have a read of you know, what the activity covers. You can also click play so you can preview a version or you know, actually load that particular activity so you can go through some of the questions and see if it fits in with what you um, are thinking. Okay, and click assign to obviously assign it to your students. Now at this point, a couple of things happens. Um, you know, your list of students in your class will appear or when internet permits. Um, on the top, you can have the start date. So by default, the start date is today. But what you can do is also get super organized and have a whole bunch of activities that starts in week three, or a whole bunch of activities that starts in week four and so forth and so on. So you effectively only spend half an hour at the beginning of the term and, and set it all up for the for um, the upcoming weeks. And you can go ahead and do that. And if you are running late with your lessons, you can always push back the start date and so forth and so on. So it's completely up to you. Then you've got the due date. By default, it is one week after the start date. But again, think about your timetabling 
um, your homework schedules, for example, what some schools do is every Thursday is when homework is due. So they make the due date um, on a Wednesday night, for example, or a Friday. So it really depends on the schedule at your school. So I'm just gonna leave it as um, one week from the start date for now. Sorry, one week from the start date for now. And enable Prodigy Timer. Now, because this is a, a Prodigy activity, you can turn on or off Prodigy Timer. So remember when I was showing you guys um, the Prodigy activities before, and um, you know there was a little sort of countdown timer at the top, uh, that's the timer. So if you wanna turn it off, then just leave it grayed out. But if you feel that you are, your students are, challenge, are ready for the challenge, and look, I personally, I'm a bit nasty. I like to turn the timer on because it keeps the kids on task, um, but it's completely up to you because the last thing you wanna do is um, to effectively, you know, to make it counterproductive for your kids, basically. So at this point, other things you can do, you can assign this task to um, everybody in the class, okay? Or you could choose to assign the task to just the students who never passed, or you can tick and untick this list as you see fit, okay? Make your personalized selections, um, click done when you are ready and that task will become active and will populate or pop into your students to do list straight away, okay? Um, so it's instant. Now, as your students complete those activities, you can track their progress. Other ways of finding activities on Manga High, so of course we talked about the folder system or the folder structure, and you can go through the folders and find games and so forth um, to assign to your students, right? Um, so here are some games activities. So you can do that, or alternatively, you could say, right, I'm teaching fractions at the moment, and in the chat box, sorry, not in the chat box, in the search box, just type in fractions, and it'll find some activities related to that search term for you. And once you have located or identified the activity, then just go ahead, click into it just as you did before and click assign and assign it to your students. And I must apologize again for the slowness of the internet connection. Um, and of course, go ahead and assign. The other way of finding activities would be under the filters. So let me show this to you quickly. So I've clicked on the filter on the top right hand corner. I could say I'm only interested in games activities. Okay, um, or I'm only interested in, if you look at the courses, I'm only interested in games around, this is, so basically you can use all of these filters to your benefit, okay. Down the track, and this is not live yet, I apologize for some of the curriculum, is um, numeracy learning progression. So this is the new numeracy learning progression mapping that is based on um, ACARA's release from March 2020, I believe, uh, version three of it. And um, Victoria, the Victorian um, curriculum is also incorporating or is being mapped to the Victorian, sorry, it's being mapped to the new learning uh, progression as well. Okay, so the idea here is you can use these filters, find the activity that you, you want to assign to your students and go ahead and assign it and away you go. Now, when your students have completed any of those tasks, so if I pop into class assignments, for example, now, right, um, what you can see is all of the activities that your students are currently working through. So it's sitting on your students' to-do list as we speak. And you can track and see if they have passed the activity or failed the activity. So click into the task and you can see how many students have passed or failed, whether or not they've made three attempts um, and who you need to support in order for them to become be more successful. So in terms of supporting to your students, always as a starting point, Point, check to make sure that they have made at least three attempts because that's always the, the sort of the minimum expectation, if you wish, for our, for our kids, okay? Um, bear with me, so that's not bringing up the full task. I'll click into it again, sorry. Okay, so in this case, it shows us three students have passed, Three students have not passed. If you scroll down, you can see, um, you know, Evan Wong got three attempts, got a gold medal, great. Zach, three attempts, fantastic. Then you have Betty, sorry, Betty, who's made one attempt, Christine, one attempt, Sebastian, one attempt. So the first thing I'd really want to address here is to make sure that students are attempting the task at least three times and understand why they should be doing that. 
We want them to expose themselves to at least 30 questions. We want them to use their mistakes, so make sure they review their incorrect answers and actually you know, really learn from their mistakes and um, hopefully, you know, progressively grow towards those hard and extreme questions. And of course, it also allows you if your students are doing the right thing and yet they are not passing. So in other words, if you are seeing students that says three attempts but still have not passed, they're the kids that you kind of want to tap on the shoulder and say, hey, let's go through this together. Let's work one on one. So it allows you to start really personalising your teaching or your support for those individual students and allowing kids who can, um, you know, sort of work through it themselves and pass the activities themselves if you set up the right environment or if you set up the right expectations right at the start. Now the other thing also is um, you know in terms of setting expectations one of the easiest way of doing that is not to sort of tell your kids what the processes are but rather you can actually model the process with them as well so again keeping in mind I'm in class assignments and I've clicked into one of the activities your kids are working on but if you click on info then you can actually click play and it actually brings up that specific activity which you can use in the classroom and actually teach with it. You can teach with it, go through the questions with your students, um, keeping in mind when they go ahead and do it on their own session, they're going to get a, separate, a different set of questions anyway. So they're not just going to copy it off you, off the board, and then, um, you know, in order to pass, they, you know, they will actually have their own set of 10 questions and it could be, you know, easy medium, hard or extreme. So it's completely up to their own session. But what, what I do want to show you is similar to what we did earlier at the start of this session, play the activity together with your kids, show them that they need to answer three in a row correct in order to move up to the next level, deliberately get some questions wrong so you can show them that you know if they've got a couple of questions wrong they're going to move back down to the previous level again. But most importantly show them at the end on the summary screen make sure they review their questions, click on show solution and actually learn from it. You know, really get your kids to write it down. And once they follow that process, we see a lot more success in our students. One, they don't give up. Two, they understand why they, you know, what they're going to do about mistakes. So rather than saying, you got this wrong, we kind of follow on the conversation by saying, okay, well, this is what you do about it. So it's really important as a workflow at the start of the year to set those expectations with your students. Okay, um, the next thing I wanted to show you, sorry, I've got messages coming through. The next thing I wanted to show you guys is um, you know, when you are running tasks to your students, of course, you can create, um, assign different tasks to your students at, um, you know, it, sorry, let me start again. You can assign different tasks to different students in your list. Um, so you don't always have to assign tasks to the entire group at the same time. But alternatively, and I have noticed this even more these days, is um, this idea of creating subgroups in your class. So that what so what I mean by that is one A might be you know there might be um, five students that are working sort of below grade, and then you might have a group of students who are working at level, and some students who are ready for extension and so forth. So creating subgroups for your class is a really nice and easy way for you to make sure that you're always assigning tasks level appropriate tasks for your students as well. So in terms of supporting differentiation on Manga High, there are three levels of support. The first level is of course the activity itself um, adapts to suit the individual students which is what we spoke about earlier about recommended work so the system will automatically find activities for your kids and recommends level appropriate tasks for them the third level of differentiation is of course what we're about to do is you putting as a teacher you put your kids in the correct subgroups and therefore assigning different tasks to suit them um, now the key here is your students don't actually know that they've been placed into a subgroup so you know if it is a sensitive conversation you know they don't need to know as far as they know is that you know my teacher has assigned me a whole collection of activities and different kids get different activities so it's completely fine all right so all you do is you click into admin in your teacher page click into admin and the workflow is this um, you want to create an empty class first that's the first thing you want to do and the second thing then is to then pull your kids from existing class into this empty class 
Um, so keeping in mind your kids can actually belong to multiple groups. So they can be in one CK as well as one CK group one, one CK group two or one CK group three. Okay, so think about that process. So think about if you want your kids to be in a main group as well as those through subgroups. Now, what you need to do is make sure in order to create classes that don't have any students in there, you need to make sure that you toggle this school invite link onto blue. Um, that's the little trick here. Um, and the next thing you wanna do is click on plus. All right, so nice and simple. Uh, when you plus a class, when you name your class, just make sure you um, think about the, the way that you name your classes so that there is, it still makes some kind of reference back to the original class, just so that it doesn't get confusing. So I might say the group ones are working at year one level um, and keep that manually add students later on grey, so that's cool. And then go ahead and do the same thing and create your next subgroup. And um, you can create as many subgroups as you want. So keeping in mind, as you create those subgroups, just make sure you favorite them. So put that little yellow star next to the name so that, because if you can imagine if you've got 10 classes at your school and each class has, you know, three different subgroups associated with it, um, pretty quickly you're gonna get up to 40 sort of, you know, names on that list. So creating that favorite class is going to be really, really handy for you. Um, so let's just pretend we've created multiple subgroups and you're ready to start moving students. So the way you would do that is uh, moving students, you can go into the original class and find the student that you want to move. So to TH, for example, I'm bringing up a whole list of students in there and I find Mava is a student that I want to move. Click on the little crayon next to Mava's name and click on change or add class. And once you've done that, it gives you a whole list of classes available in your school that you can place Mava into. So I'm going to keep Mava in both TH as well as TH1. Okay, Sm happy with that selection and click tick and then save. So now it's telling us that Maver now belongs to both these groups. So the TH group as well as TH1. So if you're assigning tasks to TH1, top left hand corner. If you're assigning tasks to TH1, then Maver will get them. If you're assigning tasks to TH, then everyone including Maver will get those activities as well. Okay, so that's nice and easy. So have a think about how, you know, you want to place your kids into subgroups and how it works best for you. Now, if you have accidentally created any subgroups that you don't actually want, um, or you need to rename them or anything like that, then it's nice and easy. So let me show you quickly. Um, we've clicked into 2TH1. I don't really want that class anymore. Click on the three dots menu on the top right hand corner and click delete. So you can delete um, those students or that class. So now Maver now belongs to just the, the 2TH. Okay, so that's the, the sort of the, um, you know, task there in terms of assigning uh, your kids into the different subgroups. This PowerPoint slide deck, by the way, I have included in the download and I will also forward it on to you guys at the end of this session. So feel free to share it with your team. Um, I have also included this quick slide here about our brand new junior contents. I know in this session we have some high school teachers as well as some primary school teachers. I'm not going to get into the brand new junior contents, but you will be able to find them in your normal assigned tasks. You'll find Prodigy Junior folder and that's where all the new junior contents are, are in. Okay, so I'll leave it there, but in the slide deck that you get to download, you can um, actually go through it yourself in your own time as well. But again, anytime if you have any questions, Questions, just let me know. Now let me just quickly jump into the whole monitoring piece. So how to track your students progress. So the first thing again you want to do is to go ahead and select the class that you are working with. All right. Um, we looked at class assignments already which is where um, you can track your students progress based on the current assignments or the tasks they are currently working on. At this point, I also want to point out, remember when your students log into Manga High, they can access everything that you've assigned for them. You can, they can also access any recommended activities. Um, they can also access, you know, my progress charts and so forth. And that can sometimes get a little bit distracting. Um, and sometimes, you know, you've got 20 minutes in your class and you want your kids to focus on just what's on the assignment list. You can do that. And the way you would do it is in your class. So have your class selected in class assignments. Top right hand corner, 
turn on classroom mode and what will happen is when you turn on classroom mode or when classroom mode is active your students will only have access to those assigned tasks that you have given them okay so nothing else no recommendations no games free play and so forth so it really depends on um, how you want to manage your classroom but I'm going to turn this off uh, just in case any kids in 2TH is currently trying to do some homework the other thing also is if they click into reports Oh, if you click into reports, you can track your students' progress against the curriculum, um, track how they're going with those activities you've assigned. You can even see how much time they're spending on Manga High, whether they're spending um, time at home or at school doing Manga High work. So there's a lot of data in there um, that you can track, but it should all be fairly straightforward. But I do want to show you a very hidden piece though. So the assignments report is where you can track your students' progress against the tasks or in the tasks that you have set for them. If you click into the assignments report, you can see who the students are um, that has already gotten started, how many activities attempted versus how many activities passed. But there is this sneaky little tab here called Show Grid View, and which allows you to actually track all of this information in a table format as well. Now, all of this data is um, actionable, if you wish. So if you click on Know About Days, Weeks and Months, for example, it actually brings up for you the details around who's done it, how many attempts they've made, um, etc. So you can also look at, so in this case, you can see nine attempts, but still have not passed. Okay, that's obviously an activity that you'd really want to go through in class if you are the, this class's teacher. Or you can also click into the individual students' names and you can track and see which other activities they've done above and beyond any activities, um, you know, which other activities they've passed, which activities they have not passed and so forth. If I go back, you can also at this point, everything is all interlinked. You can also, if you think about it, at this point, if you've seen, you know, there's a whole bunch of kids that have not passed the activity, in your mind, you're thinking, okay, well, let's let's play this activity in class. So you can click into info and actually click play right from this page. You don't have to go back and locate it again. Um, click play and it actually opens up this activity um, in front of the class and go through it with your kids as well. All right. All of these reports, by the way, top right hand corner, always look for the three dots menu. Uh, you can actually download all of this information into your Excel, into an Excel doc as well. Okay. Um, lots and lots of information, lots of data in here. So how much time are they, your kids spending on it and so forth. Now I want to pop into your students page quite quickly. So I've now toggled over into a sample student account. Um, if your students click into their name, so you can show them how to do this as well, get your students to click into their name. Okay, and um, sorry, it's not happening for me right now, but if they click into their name, they can actually track their progress. So all of this information that we looked at earlier about assignments completion, curriculum progress, you can, as a teacher, you can track all of that data for your entire class or the individual students. But as the students, they can track that same data for themselves. And we feel that that's really powerful because all of a sudden you're kind of flipping that responsibility back on your students. So they don't need to wait until you tell them, hey, they've got 50% pass or 75% pass, but they can track that in themselves as well so they can become more accountable um, for their own progress. So all of this information is available to your students and I really encourage your kids to do, um, to you know, encourage you to actually point it out to your kids as well. They can also click to see, I want to, um, you know, just look at this data for last year, for example, or I can look at this data for this year um, or this time frame. So it's really very flexible for your kids. They can click into a particular report and it actually pulls up the list of activities that they need to work on. So it tells you here are some of the, here's a list of activities you have passed during that time frame you've selected. Uh, here's a list of activities that you attempted during that time frame. And of course, which activities you have not attempted and they can click play to actually fire up that activity as well. Okay. okay. So again, I've pre-recorded some videos here for you as well. Um, so you can play around with that. And I've talked about encourage, encouraging your students to track their own data, really, really powerful stuff, okay? Um, and just lastly, I do wanna talk about why we, why we talk about this whole idea of making sure that your students are following the correct workflow. Because what we find is that 
the, the, that sort of difference between a student that gets frustrated because Manga High is too hard versus students who really feel very empowered is this whole workflow. All right. So when you say to your kids, I want you to notice that because you worked hard at this, you started at easy, but you finished at hard or you started at bronze, but you finished at gold. Um, that conversation is really, really powerful. And showing your students how to to create that success within themselves is really, really strong. So um, I won't go through too much around this. Some of you in here might have already seen the growth mindset workflow poster, but you can click on the link and actually download a copy of that poster for yourself as well. OK, um, and just lastly, I just wanted to thank you all for joining me this afternoon. Um, and my contact details is michelle.quaid at mangahai.com. Please feel free to reach out and, um, you know, so, so we can sort of work together and make sure that you, you are feeling success. But more importantly, if I may, just just spend a couple of minutes back into uh, the Manga High Live page. There is this little chat button, this little question mark chat button here. Now, if you are struggling with any of the games, you can actually access game guides from here. So say for example, you are playing a game called Pinata Fever and you are looking for game guides for Pinata Fever. You can either type in Pinata Fever or you can go ahead and say, right, um, you know, show me all the game guides that's available. So geometry skills with Pyramid Panic. Um, here's a game called Flower Power, which is all about ordering fractions, decimals and percentages. So you can click into the, um, the actual article and bring up a video showing you how to play the game. All right. Uh, it shows you how to play the game and scroll down explanation on how to play the game as well as the scoring information associated with the game. You can also enlarge this page and simply forward it on to your students. So if you have assigned your kids flower power and they are struggling with it, they don't understand how to pass the activity, you know, just copy and paste this link and send it on to them. Okay, so there's a lot in there that you can um, share with your teachers as well. So um, I know our time's up, but let me leave you with this. This is the beginning of our conversation. I really do encourage you to, you know, share, share the growth mindset workflow poster with your kids. And um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask me. But otherwise, you know, feel free to email me whenever you need to, and um, we can work through things together. Together when you're ready, or as you come across it. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I hope you have. Um, the, you know, a good, a lovely rest of the evening and we'll talk soon. Does anyone have any questions for me? So feel free to, feel free to um, download all those documents as well.